from our own radar, start picking up items going three, 4,000 miles an hour in this area. But I do remember speeds in excess of four to 5,000 miles an hour. And he said it was traveling 10,000 miles plus. And they were going somewhere in the neighborhood of 11 to 14,000 miles an hour. They covered the distance from Columbus to Detroit in something like equivalent of about 20,000 miles an hour. It's not an infrequent occurrence out there. They have them quite often. There were probably 1,500 reported cases at that time. Uh, I have uh, over 3,000 cases now. They estimated 100 yards from the left wing was this 100-foot disk. And the strength of the signal was as strong as the surface contact on the water of an aircraft carrier. This, this contact was huge. The size of these uh, uh, objects around uh, 100 meters or greater. So it would go from 1 o'clock, 7 or 8 miles to uh, 6, 7 o'clock, 7 or 8 miles inside of uh, 4 or 5 seconds. Uh, you have to be moving pretty quickly. And they could rise, uh, just go straight up. Uh, they could uh, do that, just seemed like instantaneous. Once they started moving, they went straight up, you know, for a while, and then they went zap. Then it just sort of disappeared, it dematerialized. And left the, at the atmosphere, just was gone. It just took off into space. It just, just left at high speed. He said, you are never to speak of this again. As far as you're concerned, this never happened and you never saw this, and I don't exist, and this situation never happened. I didn't want to look at it any longer than that because I felt that my life was in jeopardy. So I was beaten, literally hitting in the ribs, and pushed, and I was resisting, and I know Sergeant Bastinza was doing the same thing. Measures have been taken by agencies to terminate people who, are, who appear to be inconvenient or troublesome through knowing too much. Whatever activity is going on, to the extent that it is a clandestine group, a quasi-government group, a uh, quasi-private group, it is without any type, as far as I can tell, of high-level government oversight. And that is a great concern. A shadowy government with its own Air Force, its own Navy, his own fundraising mechanism and the ability to pursue his own ideas of the national interest free from all checks and balances and free from the law itself. We have contact with aliens not originating from some foreign country but from some other solar system and I have been a party to that. My name is Dr. Stephen Greer. I am the director of the Disclosure Project, which is a project of the Center for the Study of Extraterrestrial Intelligence. This is a project which we have been working on since 1992. And during this time, we have identified over 400 military intelligence and corporate witnesses to special access projects within the United States and elsewhere that deal with what the public has called UFOs, extraterrestrial intelligence, and advanced energy and propulsion systems. The purpose of this executive briefing is to put together some of this witness testimony. I want to emphasize that out of the over 400 witnesses whom we have identified, that we have interviewed to date on camera approximately 100. Of those, 120 hours of videotape have been created of testimony from these witnesses. This executive summary can only contain a very small tip of the iceberg, less than one half of one percent of the possible testimony which we have. But it will give you an idea of the extent of the knowledge of these men and women who have come forward heroically to tell the world, to tell our elected representatives and our scientists the truth about a subject which has been the subject of much ridicule, fantasy, and speculation for over 50 years. We will present three essential areas. Number one, what is the evidence? What is the testimony support? What is the case file 
support and what do the government documents support. We will also then move on to something a little more difficult to explain and that is the mechanism for secrecy. How has something of this import been kept secret from our representatives and how has it been kept off the national and international radar screen effectively for over 50 years? Without understanding this, the evidence itself has no foundation because any rational person will conclude that this couldn't be true or we would know about it, that the government leaks secrets like a sieve, and that indeed, if any of this were true, many of the people in society, in high places, in our government would know about it when in fact they do not. So the secrecy around this issue, which has been extraordinary, must also be explained, and it will be. And the third component is the why. Why has it been kept secret? What are the implications? I will remind you that a very conservative Republican two-term president and five-star general, Dwight Eisenhower, said that we should be careful of the excesses of the military-industrial complex. We now have learned, and you will hear testimony to this effect, that one of his chief concerns were that special access projects within the military and intelligence sector dealing with this subject were escaping the legal constitutional oversight of the American Congress and indeed of the American presidency. He stated this in January of 1961. In the councils of government, we must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The potential for the disastrous rise of misplaced power exists and will persist. We must never let the weight of this combination endanger our liberties or democratic processes. We should take nothing for granted. Only an alert and knowledgeable citizenry can compel the proper meshing of the huge industrial and military machinery of defense with our peaceful methods and goals. Eisenhower's warning has really come full circle to this date where we now see extraordinary funds being put into projects and being withheld from the American public, which if released, could give us indeed an entirely new and sustainable civilization. These propulsion and energy systems used for peaceful purposes would enable the world to get off of its dependency of fossil fuels, oil, and the internal combustion engine and have a truly non-polluting, sustainable civilization for thousands of years. The implications of this statement cannot be overstated. We are really talking about the ability of our civilization to move within a generation from a world which is facing environmental collapse, oil shortages, rolling blackouts in some of our states, and eventually growing world tension over a shrinking oil supply while demand skyrockets over the next 10 to 20 years. That grim scenario can easily be replaced by the declassification and peaceful application of these technologies. In addition to this, we have to consider what the risks are if we do nothing. The technologies which are in compartmented secret programs that have been derived from studying extraterrestrial technologies as well as human innovations, which deal directly with energy generation and propulsion systems, are technologies which would enable the entire planet to begin to work in an integrated function and in a way that does not lead to greater and greater spiraling gaps between the rich and the poor. Beyond this, there is something of even greater concern. One of the witnesses whom you will hear from is a person who worked directly with Werner von Braun, the very famous rocket scientist and space uh, explorer, who warned on his deathbed that there were people planning to put weapons in space or to have space effective weapon systems, which would be used in a hoax scenario from a threat, a hoax threat, that would be of extraterrestrial origin. There is no evidence that we are under any threat 
from any civilization from outside our solar system or within our solar system. However, there is a lot of evidence from this testimony that there are people who are deliberately trying to weaponize space under the guise of many situations which are really hoaxed scenarios. This is dangerous because if we are not alone in the universe, we cannot view space as our own private domain for homo sapiens. We must view space as a frontier which must be shared peacefully with diverse life forms from throughout the universe. One of the points I would like to make also about these cases is that we must accept the testimony of all of these witnesses. The reason we must is that if we begin to dismiss dozens of military intelligence officers, corporate officials, as well as uh, people within other walks of life who have professional credentials, uh, their testimony on this issue then it brings into question how we view witness testimony on many other things. If we use that same standard, every murder conviction in the United States should be overturned, which has been based on witness testimony. We would also, as Monsignor Balducci at the Vatican has pointed out to us, throw out the entire Bible, since that is uh, almost totally based on witness, human witness testimony of the people who wrote down the accounts uh, during the times of Christ and his predecessors. Can show that it, at certain historical point lived a man named Jesus. E questa dimostrazione si basa sulle testimonianze degli storici. And in the end, this is based on human witness testimony. Perché come facciamo a sapere che quel Vangelo è di quello lì, quell'altro è di quello là? And how do we know that this gospel is from that man and this gospel is from this man is true? E sono le testimonianze che abbiamo And they are the testimony and tempi. the witnesses sì. of those people. Per cui, For se si reason, indebolisce il valore della testimonianza umana, If you umana, start taking apart and destroying the value of human witness testimony, Le conseguenze sono anche gravi, gravissime, tragiche per la religione, specie per la religione cristiana. The consequences are great, tremendous, especially for Christian uh, religion. I should emphasize that this human testimony is key, and in a sense it's more important than any physical evidence because it is multiple, it is corroborating, and it can not be tossed out in a cavalier fashion. We should be very careful that we do not ignore this testimony because the testimony of these men and women serves as a significant body of evidence with the corroboration of photographs and other government documents. To introduce this part of the videotape which deals specifically with pilots, radar cases, cases that involved telemetry, and related technologies, I wish to emphasize that for decades, people who have been skeptical of this subject have claimed that if these objects were real, they would have been tracked on radar. We have no fewer than 20 witnesses from the Air Force, the Marines, the Navy, the Army, as well as civilian authorities in the United States and abroad who are qualified air traffic controllers and pilots who have seen these objects on radar, please note that these people absolutely will say, state that these have not been weather balloons, they have not been air inversions, they have not been swamp gas, they have been structured craft traveling at thousands of miles per hour, then suddenly stopping, hovering, or moving in a nonlinear fashion where these objects have been tracked and going from one spot to 500 miles away or further within one radar sweep. Commander Graham Bethune piloted his plane across the North Atlantic in 1951. The testimony you will hear is important and significant for a number of reasons. The object was very close. It was in 1951 and was tracked on radar moving at 1800 miles per hour, a speed which no craft in the world could move at that time. 